Welcome back to another Q&A, and in this one we're going to go through various different CEX and collecting related questions. The first one I can't actually find the actual question for, but the question was something along the lines of, is CEX a good place to buy your games consoles from? And I would argue that CEX, in terms of like their strong points, is probably their games consoles, due to the fact that literally everything that you buy from CEX comes with a two-year warranty, which means that if you're buying something older that has the potential to break just randomly due to its age. For example, you could be buying consoles that are 20, 30 years old perhaps. It is good to have the peace of mind that if anything goes wrong within the two years that you bought it, you can take it back to them and they'll give you a new one and just sort you out. For example, a few years ago, I bought a backwards compatible PlayStation 3 from CEX. Now, for those that don't know, a backwards compatible PS3 is pretty rare. It is pretty much just the ones that launched. It was the original PlayStation 3 and they go for like three or four times the price of a standard PS3. Uh, and because of that, they are also, <laughs> they're getting rarer, not because not many of them existed, but because they all are known to break over time, like quicker than pretty much any other console. They are all ticking time bombs. They are just, they're almost disasters waiting to happen. There is an entire community around like fixing and like bulletproofing backwards compatible PS3s because A, they're just is a finite supply of them, and B, it is pretty cool to be able to play a PlayStation 2 natively just by putting a disc in to a PlayStation 3 without having to do much else. There are people who mod and Frankenstein and things like that PlayStation 3s. But anyway, I bought a just a standard, regular, in-the-box PlayStation backwards compatible uh, from CX few years ago, and lo and behold, a few months later, it just broke. Sadly, actually, it broke with a game in that was a... Uh, a bit of a problem. If we come over to uh, my game collection, the game that it broke with, inside of it anyway, was Dragon Ball Z Budokai Tenkaichi 3, and it's my childhood copy. Uh, so that was a real problem, it's why the case isn't in brilliant condition, because I've had it since, well, whenever it released. Anyway, because I couldn't get the disc out, it was a bit of a problem. So I was Googling around how to actually take apart the disc tray or the, the disc bay of a, because there's no real tray, in a PlayStation 3. And it would have required me to break some seals that on this specific unit had not already been broken, which suggests that this PS3 that I had had never in its lifetime been opened up, which is kind of a red flag because of the fact that what does it look like on the inside if it's like what, not too far removed from 20 years old and has never really been cleaned. Anyway, so I didn't want to break the seal and risked CEX refusing me taking it back, so I took it back with my game in so that they could open it up and it not be a problem when it comes to my two-year warranty. So they opened it up, they got my disc out safe and sound, all is good in the world, and then they replaced that PS3. Uh, no questions asked. Um, I, they just gave me a new one. Yeah. So... I think that when it comes to buying like tech, especially older tech that for no reason at all kind of can just break, CX is a good choice, especially when the alternatives don't provide you that protection. Um, for the same, for the same, on the same note, I can't find this question either. But a question that I get asked pretty frequently is, why does it seem like I only buy things from CX? This one is a multifaceted one. One of the biggest reasons that I buy from CX, besides convenience, but we'll touch upon that, is their price stickers. Yeah. Some people would be like, as a collector, some people would hate to have a big 620 quid sticker on the front of a game like this. But when it comes to a content creation side of things, this is brilliant. You gotta remember, I primarily do short form content over on TikTok and things like that. And there, I only have a few seconds at the start of every video to stop a viewer scrolling. It isn't like on YouTube where if you guys are watching this video, you actively chose me, you picked me. You like, presumably, watching my stuff. And on that same note, if you're watching and you haven't already subscribed, if you could fix that, that'd be cool. But anyway, on TikTok, you generally only have about three seconds to get somebody's attention and stop them from scrolling to actually watch your video. Having that price sticker on is a wonderful hook. In social media, it's called a hook. You know how um, a lot of people will start a video with something dramatic that catches your attention, that keep, piques your interest, something like that. That's called a hook. For me, when it comes to collecting games, a lot of the time, that big price sticker is a golden sheep of a hook, you know? They, people saw that, and when I was making videos on Kuon when, it, when I first bought it, like a, a month or so ago, whenever that was, because they'd never seen it before, they didn't know what the game was, they'd never seen a game that expensive, especially a game that's 20 years old, 
it was like, wow, must watch this video. It's great. So I'm not going to take that sticker off because it's, it, I can do the same thing again. Like if I was to let the Kuan meme die, which I will at some point, um, I can leave it for months and months and then restart the whole thing all over again. So having these price stickers on makes it easy. But then on top of that, there's also the convenience factor in that, so for example, people are like, why don't I go to car boots and things like that? Uh, well, A, you can't guarantee what you can get. I'm quite impatient and impulsive um, when it comes to collecting things. I have a list on my phone of games that I'm after and games do not tend to stay on that list for a very long period of time before they're in my hand. So what I do is I think, yeah, that game, and then I put it on my list and then I go to CX's website because I want it now. I don't want to wait. I don't want to order it off eBay. I don't want to have to wait for it to come on to eBay because if it's something rare, I just want it now. So I go on CX, I search what CX is it at, and as long as it's like within 100 miles or so, off we get in the car and I'll go and get it and it makes for good content. you got to remember, another question people ask is, um, why don't I order things from CX more often? And it's because if I can get a video of me like getting ready, getting in the car, traveling, that is then content. Whereas if I just order things all the time, it's just me in this room unboxing stuff and that's less fun. And to be real with you, it gets me out of the house. I spent years where my only job was fitness influencer, yeah? So outside of going to the gym at like midnight every day, I don't see many people, nor do I get out of the house very frequently. So constantly like game hunting and going out to CX and things like that and traveling around has got me using my car more. For example, I've had my car over two years and I've done less than 2000 miles in it. You know, the majority of the miles that I've put on that car has been in the last three months or so that I've been collecting games professionally, you know? Um, so it's 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 sort of, again, it's, it's the multifaceted thing of, with CEX, I can guarantee that it will work because if it doesn't work, they'll give me my money back or give me a replacement. It's got the sticker on, which is really good for social media in terms of a hook and keeping people's attention. It's convenient in that I know it's there when I want it, as long as the stock says that it is. Um, I can get it immediately because I can just get in the cart and go, or I can click and collect. Yeah. And the other downside to having things delivered, by the way, is that with CEX, they charge like three pound per item. So for example, I, I bought like 10 games the other day and somebody commented about why don't I just get them delivered? And it's because if I'd have got 10 items delivered, if I spent, if I, I think I spent 40 pound on those 10 games the other day, um, if I'd have had all 10 of those delivered, that would have been a 70 pound order rather than a 40 pound order because I'd have had to pay three quid 10 times over for three quid per item, which wouldn't have been very fun. Next question. Because you get through so many games so often, do you still enjoy playing games or does it feel more like a chore? I think one of the reasons that I don't really ever experience burnout when it comes to games is, it's it's a few things. One of them is my constant need to be productive. We'll, we'll touch upon that in a sec because, yeah. And two, I don't take very long with almost any game that I play in terms of beating it. And because of that, I don't think I ever get really burnt out on it. Like, there are occasions where I will finish playing a game, but I still won't be in my brain anyway ready to move on, but I'll move on anyway. So for example, uh, uh, one of those was earlier this year, I played Lies of P for the, first, for the first time ever. And I really loved that game. Like it's one of my favorite games now. I've only played it once still. And, but when I finished it, I moved on to whatever was next. But because of that, I have that itch to play it at some point again. Uh, that's how I always describe it. I get like an itch to play things. Um, and because I very rarely stay with a franchise long enough to get tired of it, that itch by the time I'm finished playing it isn't always scratched and therefore is there again when I want to play it again. Um, and I will usually try to like mix up what I play dramatically. So for example, in the last couple of months, I went Saints Row games to Spider-Man games. That's quite the difference. And then I went Saints Row to Ratchet and Clank, which to be fair, similar-ish, I suppose, in terms of like Family friendly, family friendly third person action games. But then I went from Ratchet and Clank to Silent Hill, which is about as polar opposite as you could get. The only way I could have gotten more opposite from that is maybe if now I went and played all of the Call of Duty campaigns, you see? Um, so I don't really ever get burnt out from it ever. Like if anything, I, I only feel burnout when I'm not playing. Like for example, right? There's something wrong with my brain where when I'm waiting for something to happen, I struggle to commit to starting and doing anything else. So at the minute, soonish in the next few weeks or so, we're going on holiday. And I feel like I can't do anything right now. I haven't played anything now for about four or five days since I beat Wukong because 
I, I don't know, I just feel like I can't start something knowing that soon I'm going to have to do something else that's going to put that on hold. You see? It's it's like, it's it's the scaled up version of, you know, when people feel like they can't leave the house because they've got something to do later on in the day. Like, uh, anyone that's worked retail might have um, a relate, might relate to this a little bit, where maybe you start work at 7pm and you're doing a late shift, but you feel like you, are, you can't do anything during the daytime because you're working at the night, you know? Or if you've got a delivery coming, you can't do anything until that delivery is there, even though it says that it's not coming until after four o'clock and you've got hours till then. It still feels like you can't do anything. That, that's me, but on a on a larger scale in my brain, it's, it's really dumb. Um, so I feel like, if anything, I am at my happiest when I am playing, especially from that needing to be productive thing. Um, some people might think this is a bit sad, but this is, again, kind of how my brain is. I am kind of quite entrepreneurial. Um, it's how I've built the life that I lead, I suppose. And I struggle to do things if they're not earning me money in some way. Just, you know, it, it's... Okay, I struggle to put in a lot of hours into something unless it's going to be productive, you know? I know people... I, oh, Christ, this could this could be a rant. I know people that commit their entire lives to things to the detriment of being able to pay their own bills to do something that will never earn them a penny. You know, again, this this is very specific because of me being uh, because of me being in the fitness niche for so long. Right. There are so many people who want to be professional bodybuilders, for example, that will never, ever be a professional bodybuilder, not realizing that if they just committed more to like the social media side of things, that they would earn far more from fitness than they ever would actually competing as a bodybuilder because that's just how that works this is a bit niche i know for the gamers they might not understand why that is but trust me that's how that is um there are social media bodybuilders out there that earn more money than guys that will step on the tip top bodybuilding stage every year because that's just how that works or there are people who just don't have the genetics to ever succeed with it but still try and try and try again to the detriment of their ability to earn money because of the fact that we only have 24 hours in a day and if you are committing such a massive chunk of time to something, like, trust me, especially when it comes to things like bodybuilding, people will, it is a full-time commitment. It's not just the time in the gym. It's what you do outside the gym that matters too. And th there are people who I know will talk about how they need to earn more money. They're struggling with finances and things like that. But again, are still so fully committed to things that don't earn the money. And I don't know that it confuses me. It's just, not everyone's brain is wired the same, and I recognize that. But yeah, my brain is wired that if I'm going to put a massive amount of time into something, I need to be, it needs to be productive in terms of earning. Yeah. So, and that is enjoyable to me because I think this is something else that people have uh, in their head that is not necessarily accurate in that a lot of people think that once something becomes a job, once something is earning you money, that is inherently no longer fun at all. There is definitely some truth in that once you make a hobby a job, it loses some aspect of fun, but I think that it's more accurate to say that it gains an aspect of stress. Yeah? Um, that's probably more accurate to say. Anyone that's ever turned a hobby into a job can probably agree with that in terms of it adds stress where there previously wasn't something. And I have now turned a hobby into a job twice. First I did it with fitness, and now I've done it with gaming. Um, and it hasn't ruined either of them, but it just adds stress, you know? I still don't miss gym sessions. I still do everything I need to do in the gym. I still play games all day, every day and love it. And I think that a lot of people are so ingrained in this mentality of, I hate my job, I hate going to work, that they fail to realize that not everything that is a job can still be fun. Or not everything that is a job has to not be fun. And in, in, in that instance, for me, it's like double fun. I love the fact that I'm, in, I'm fortunate enough to have built this where I can play games all day, every day, and the more time I commit to it, the more videos I make, the more I speak to the camera, the more money I can earn. It's double fun. It's the fun of playing the game and it's the fun of earning money. You know, that's the reality. So, yeah, I think I don't burn out because gaming all day, every day scratches two of my biggest itches that I like having scratched. It's I get to scratch the gaming itch and the productivity with earning money itch. It would be a problem more if I was to put this amount of time into gaming without also having the bills paid. Could you imagine that? If I was, imagine how dumb I would be if I put 12 hours a day into gaming and then that was obviously causing a detriment to my ability to earn money because of something else that was getting negatively affected by that 12 hours there. We only have so many hours into a day, you know, 
And when it comes to being successful in business, often balance isn't really something you can have until you've actually already succeeded. Uh, most people who have done like big things in business tell you they had to work balls to the wall for a long time before they were able to take the foot off the pedal and just maintain for a while. Um, so yeah, I I still love playing games. I love it more because it's it pays the bills now. You know, it comes with the added stress of I never know how many views something's going to get. And sometimes I have to choose what games I'm playing based around real world events because I can maximize views based on that. But it doesn't mean that it's any less fun when I'm actually playing it. So I hope that made sense. And I hope that I was able to communicate that in a way that didn't make me seem like a dick because I try not to do that. Although it, TikTok tells me I'm not very good at that. Anyway, next question. Don't recall seeing any PlayStation 1 games in your videos. Do I not collect or play those? So in between reading that and like this portion of the video, I counted up how many PlayStation 1 games I have. I have 10, so not very many. Um, generally, I don't collect for the PlayStation 1 outside of finishing off franchises of games that are primarily on other systems. So for example, two games that I'm on the lookout for right now are Grand Theft Auto 1 and 2 for the PlayStation 1, because that would then complete my Grand Theft Auto collection across like the entire franchise. Uh, other examples of where I've done that is Resident Evil 1, 2, 3, and Survivor, or Silent Hill 1, or Metal Gear Solid 1. I don't tend to play much PlayStation 1 because it wasn't really my era. It is a little bit before my time. It was my first console, the PlayStation 1, but I was also a toddler. I was a toddler and I remember the first two games that I ever played, I don't know which one was first, but they are my earliest gaming memories, is Shrek Treasure Hunt for the PlayStation 1 and Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. Um, I remember playing both of those as a toddler and I would have been no more than four. But when it comes to my actual, like, gaming childhood, PlayStation 2 and onwards was where it really began. So that's where I really focus my collecting, especially because I feel like those games have held up a little bit better than, like, a lot of the old PlayStation 1 stuff has. So I do... I wouldn't say I play uh, PlayStation 1. It's just that it, there, are, there, are, there are some games I will play on PlayStation 1, like Resident Evil and Silent Hill. Those I'll play. But especially due to the fact that I don't have much space left, I, I, I'm running out of space for collecting now. To add another entire system to the list that has hundreds of games would just be a poor choice of space. And I, yeah, I can't. Especially when I do try to only buy things that I will actually play. The only exemptions to that rule, exceptions to that rule are finishing off franchises, um, where sometimes I'll buy a game that isn't a very good game, but it means that I've got every game in that franchise. Am I going to get Dragon Ball Sparking Zero on release? I absolutely am. Speaking of gaming itches that I get, I have had an itch now to play Dragon Ball Z of some variety for months. Um, specifically, I kind of want to play Dragon Ball Z Kakarot because the RPG elements of that game in terms of the damage numbers going through the roof and insane seem satisfying to my little brain. It looks like it would scratch some sort of itch in there. However, I'm holding back because I know Sparking Zero is coming and my childhood is those Budokai Tenkaichi games. I genuinely credit Dragon Ball Z Budokai Tenkaichi 1 for teaching me to read. I did not get on very well academically. Um, I didn't enjoy school. I know that I am kind of well-spoken, but my family's from Warsaw. My mom, if you heard my mom speak, you would not like assume that I was her son because I just sound different. I don't know why I sound the way I sound, but I just do. I didn't do well in school. Um, yeah, anyway, I remember one day, I, here, here's the fun story. My mom agrees with this. My mom credits the same thing. Uh, we, My mom and I, we credit Yu-Gi-Oh! for teaching me maths because I used to duel my friends a lot and obviously you have to know basic maths to add and subtract attack points and life points and such. And we uh, accredit the character illustration and biographies within the Dragon Ball Z Budokai Tenkaichi games for my ability to read and uh, kind of be eloquent. Because for one, I remember once I, when I was like six or seven, when Dragon Ball Z Budokai Tenkaichi 1 came out, I think it was like 2004, maybe 2005. If it came out in 2005, I was seven. And at that time, I read through over the course of an entire evening, like every single character biography in that game, because that was at a time where I had never watched the Dragon Ball Z anime at that point, because it wasn't something that I could watch in that house. We only had dongle internet, so it wasn't really something I'd find on the internet. Um, we only had one computer in the house, because that's just how it was back then. We didn't have like the TV channels necessary to have watched it live either. So I, my only experience with the Dragon Ball Z story was the games, and the Tenkaichi games were the most... Um, fleshed out versions of that story, especially due to those character biographies. So yeah, I hold, the, the Tenkaichi series holds a special place in my heart. So obviously Dragon Ball's Parking Zero is going to get played day one. And I'm pretty sure 
that it comes out a few days after Silent Hill 2 Remake, which means I'm going to have to blitz through that, which, to be fair, it's a single-player horror game, so it's only going to be about seven hours long anyway. Uh, it's probably one day at a, at a push, especially being as I played through Silent Hill 2, the original, a while ago, uh, like a few weeks ago, so I, I should... I, I, yeah, it should be fine. I won't even actually have to rush. I'll just play it a lot and it'll finish. But yeah, I am. Okay, this is more of a social media question, so we'll see if anyone's interested. I've saved it to the end of the video to not bore people. Kale, if you could only upload two videos a day, what UK time would you upload them for the best chance with engagement? I am pretty sure this question comes from the perspective of TikTok, not YouTube, by the way. I'm going to give you an answer here, and to be honest, I'm not entirely sure how helpful it's going to be, because it's a yes and a no and a yes. I'll explain. I believe that the time of day that you upload matters, then it doesn't matter, then it does matter, then it doesn't matter. What I mean by that is it depends upon the size of your account. It depends upon who you want to see your videos. So for example, if somebody has got no followers whatsoever, I don't believe that it matters what time of day you upload. And when I say no followers, I mean a few hundred to a few thousand perhaps. Um, and we're talking about TikTok here. Again, on TikTok, cumulatively, I've got over 900,000 followers. I've been doing TikTok professionally for years now. It's, it's what I do. Um, when you've got very little followers, because of the way that TikTok works, TikTok serves your content pe to people. You don't, like I said at the start of this video, you guys that are watching this YouTube video, you chose me, you clicked this video, you picked me. You've wait, you see what I mean? You picked me. On TikTok, that's not how that works. People scroll and the algorithm serves people content regardless of whether or not they will like it, just based upon what they think it'll like, based upon how they've engaged with things. Um, so when you've got very few followers, the time of day you upload doesn't matter too much because you don't have enough followers yet for you to be really too concerned about whether or not the people that are already following you are going to see that video because they're going to be around or awake to watch it. Does that make sense? I think that line of thought is typically more applicable once you've got like 10,000 followers or above. Like maybe between 10,000 and 100,000 followers, you should pay attention to the time of day that you upload. Between 10,000 and 100,000, it makes sense to upload at a time of day where the majority of the audience that you have are actually going to be awake and around. So for example, again, I'm, I'm talking about TikTok primarily, but if I look at YouTube, right, the, on YouTube, I'm small. I've only got like 17,000 followers, so I have to pay attention to this a little bit more. Mr. Beast, for example, the biggest guy on the planet, he could upload at any given time of day he wants and still get millions of views. This is the example here, yeah? It would not matter what time of day he uploads because he's just got enough people that the video will do well regardless. Little old me here, I need to upload when people that are going to watch my stuff or the people that I want to watch my stuff are actually at home, on their phones, on their laptops, on their TVs, watching videos. So I upload around 6 p.m. because that's around dinner time where everyone is either out of school or out of work and usually not doing much. That's where I upload, that's why I upload usually at 6 p.m. on YouTube. Now, on TikTok, it's the same logic there where I think that between say 10,000 and 100,000, upload when your general following is going to be awake or specifically when the people that you want to be seeing your videos are awake. So for example, if there was a bit of a niche um, not, I mean, it is niche, but also a bit more nuanced perspective here. If you were trying to get a specific region to see your videos, that might influence the time of day they upload as well. So for example, if you were to try to target Americans, it might make sense to upload at like 3 a.m. UK time, because then you'd be targeted, you might get videos more easily pushed out to like the people in America where it's like 7, 8, 9 o'clock p.m. Um, yeah, but obviously... It depends upon the people that you want. So again, this this is specifically like what UK time. So presuming you're from the UK, you want UK people. Um, at, at the start, it kind of doesn't matter because your videos are just going to get served up to people randomly anyway. But you could probably just stick to times a day logically that people are going to be around. I don't, on TikTok especially, I feel like this is something that doesn't truly matter anyway because your video's best performance is typically not within its immediate upload period. It's, it's not like YouTube where, on YouTube, for example, a video can, like, months down the line take off. TikToks are dead in the water after a few days, but it's usually within the first few hours that a TikTok has its best chance of succeeding. Like, for example, the other day I went to sleep with a video on, like, 10,000 views, and I woke up and it had a million views. Um, so even though I uploaded it at, like, midnight, it was overnight that it got the substantial amount of views. So the t fact that I uploaded it at midnight didn't really matter. So I'm, I'm rambling a little bit now, so I'm going to actually try and be a bit more helpful. So when you're first starting, I don't think it matters too much, but upload with the people that you want to see it in mind and choose times of day where they're going to be around. 
lunchtime is another good time I upload because people are on the phones, not not at work. Um, as long as people have finished work, that is another good time. Um, you could upload at 3 p.m. ish, but that is risky. I personally wouldn't choose to upload at 3 p.m. because I want older audiences viewing my videos because that results in higher RPM, I get paid more. Um, generally, for example, 80% of my YouTube sub subscribers are apparently above 25. They're older than me, which is wonderful because it means that I get paid more. You know, whereas if your following is primarily 13, you're going to get paid less. So if you aim at 3 p.m. where older people are still at work because normal people work till like 5, 6 p.m., but the kids have finished school, so they're around to watch your video, so they're going to be your primary audience, then again, now you're uploading for a specific audience in mind, and it sort of depends upon the kinds of content that you create and who you're trying to get to see the video anyway. But at some point, again, this is not where you're at because otherwise you wouldn't be asking the question, but at some point it then doesn't matter again. Like I say, once I think you're above 100,000 followers on Instagram or even like a few hundred thousand on, on TikTok even, then you can upload whenever you want again. I've tested this many times. I've uploaded at really random times of the day and it doesn't really ever seem to matter. As long as it's like... I found sometimes that if I upload early in the morning, it doesn't do too well. So lip, like between 7 a.m. and 12 in the afternoon. But generally I've seen that between 12 p.m. and like 3 a.m., it really doesn't matter what time of day I upload. But granted, those are accounts where I've got hundreds of thousands of followers. So I think once you get to that point, then it doesn't matter because you have enough followers at that point that doesn't matter what time zone sees that video, you have always got someone that follows you that is awake at the time you're posting or around, you see? When you've got more total followers, there's always going to be someone that is awake on their phone to see your video. So it doesn't really matter too much. I, I hope that helped. Yeah. There is, I've got like a social media guide ebook thing in my description where I sort of say all of this probably a little bit more eloquently rather than me just rambling at the camera. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video and I'll see you later.